Hello, hello, hello. So last talk today is given by uh, John Lucci and uh, we'll talk about better models in optimization. And after the talk there is a reception, so stay until the end. That's, that's great motivation, I like that. That's good, yeah. Uh, hopefully this won't become a marathon by the end because I know you've been, been at this all day. Uh, so anyway, so um, yeah, I'm going to tell you about what I will call better models and optimization. This is based on joint work with my student uh, Hilal Asi, who's, uh, who's done a really wonderful job uh, kind of really pushing this project along, so a lot of credit should go to him. Um, but let me jump in. So uh, the, and I have, how long, 40 minutes? 40 minutes. 40 minutes, okay. So uh, the outline, let me go through an outline. I'm going to actually start today by talk, giving a few motivating experiments to uh, hopefully sort of set the stage and make you think, okay, maybe this could be interesting. It's something we might want to actually listen to. Uh, after that, I'm going to um, sort of jump down through and talk about sort of models in optimization, what I mean by that. And then I'm going to try to make, own, well, sort of tangential connections to the broader theme of this workshop of robustness by telling you about sort of stability and robustness in stochastic optimization problems and sort of adaptivity to easy problems. And that's what I'll mean by kind of robustness and things like this. Uh, we'll talk about some more experimental results. And then if there's time, depending on where we are, we might talk about some extensions of this work to uh, relaxations of convex problems. OK, so what's the, uh, so let's, let's get started. So the problem in this talk for the whole thing, I'm going to be trying to minimize a function, which I will represent as capital F. This is a population objective, big F which is the expectation of a little function f of x and s will stand for sample, or whatever you want to call it, okay? Which is integral, just the expectation of your instantaneous losses, little f, subject to some constraints on uh, our parameter vector x, okay? Uh, and when, when you have some kind of uh, stochastic optimization problem like this, you know, you measure your losses as an expectation under a distribution, the sort of standard method that we've all heard of is the stochastic uh, subgradient method, right? Uh, or the stochastic gradient method, which <coughs> is a simple method. What we do is we uh, take a random sample s from our distribution, compute an element of the subdifferential of my function or its gradient or something, and then we take a step in the negative subgradient direction, all right? And many of us have spent many years analyzing these kinds of things. So now let me ask three questions. Mostly, basically, why do we use this method? Okay, uh, I think one reason we might use it is because it's easy to analyze, and so we like things that are easy to analyze. Uh, another reason, honestly, I think is a big reason we use it is because it's the default in TensorFlow and PyTorch, right? So you're like, oh, I opened up PyTorch and boom, it worked, right? Uh, another reason is that it works. That was that went up for a reason. Uh, you know, that's a question. And it's not clear to me that it actually does. I mean, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. So let's, let's go through a couple of plots. So this is a, these are some experiments that I ran. Uh, and, and what I'm plotting in these plots, so we'll spend a little bit of time on this so we can understand it, is I'm, I, I have an objective. In this case, it's just the squared error, a linear regression problem. So ai transpose x minus bi squared, averaged over some sample of size m. Forgive me, uh, Peter and Peter. Uh, I'm an optimization person today, so. M, M is the sample size, A and B are the data, and X is the optimization vector. I apologize, uh, but... You couldn't have confused us better. <laughs> uh, that's what it's going to be for this talk. So, so anyway, so, so this is my objective. On this axis, what I'm going to plot, on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the initial step size I feed into my methods. Okay, so these are, you know, X minus alpha GK. So this is some initial step size. And on this axis is the number of iterations my stochastic method takes to solve the problem to some epsilon accuracy. What that is is not super important. So, okay, there are three methods, the stochastic gradient method, what I'll call the truncated methods, and what I'll call the prox methods. And we'll describe what these are shortly. So on this problem, whatever it happens to be, you know, when the step sizes are too small, none of the methods work, they never converge. When the step sizes are right, they all kind of behave the same. And when the step sizes are too big, the methods don't seem to work. Okay, <coughs> seems about right. What's that? Works well. Works well, yeah. Works well for uh, the step size 0.1. Okay. Uh, what was your initialization? Just zero. <laughs> yeah. Don't you decrease the step size with iterations? Yeah, yeah. We have some kind of rate. I mean, this is going to be, these kind of plots are going to be robust for all sorts of different rates of decreasing the step size and things like this. So throughout, we'll have a step size which is something like alpha k is equal to alpha 0 k to the minus beta where typically beta will be in something like one half to one and alpha zero 
is greater than zero. Okay. So but let's, what's that? So if I start from alpha zero equals 10, after three iterations, I'm at, at an alpha, which is? No, 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 sorry, sorry. This is, this is the number of iterations the method runs to actually solve the problem. Okay, so if I'm at this point in the plot, so this reminds me my initial step size was 0.2, and it took me uh, 400 or so iterations to get an epsilon accurate solution. Okay. But if I started with 10, after three iterations, I'm down to? If I start with a step, initial step size of 10. After three iterations, my step size is much smaller than I should. You'd think so, but evidently not. Because, because my x went... I mean, I wrote the code and it converges and it doesn't converge, right? So you might your, think that's your true, first, but... Your first steps took you away. Your first steps, you went flying off to who knows where, and, you know, then you never got back. Right? I mean, yeah, sure, if I went for 100,000 steps, I mean, this plot, you know, we could keep going, but I had to terminate the thing so I could write my talk, right? You know, but we could change the problem a little bit, and then uh, something a little bit different happens. So here's the stochastic gradient method. It still works for, you know, a couple of step sizes, but then for other ones it doesn't work. But evidently, these methods are doing better. And it turns out if I make the problem a little bit easier, then, well, you know, these methods, whatever they are, I'll tell you about them later, you know, they're sort of working for orders of magnitude more step sizes. That's five orders of magnitude right there from 0.1 up to uh, 10,000, yeah, 10,000, okay? So, so I'm gonna just start with that and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't always use stochastic gradient methods. Like the other methods, whatever these are, seem to work as well in some cases, and in other cases, they seem to be doing better. So let me start to dig in and tell you kind of what's going on here and explore this a little bit, okay? Oh, there's another one. Oh, this is with absolute loss, things get worse. Okay, so what do I mean by models in optimization? So uh, we take a step back and ask ourselves, okay, how do we typically solve optimization problems? What we do is we build some good or approximate but very simple local model of our function f to be minimized. Okay, and then after we build that good but simple local model, we minimize it. And maybe we add some kind of regularization so our steps don't go flying all over the place. Okay, so if, if we were to do gradient descent, uh, well, what the model that I'm going to make is a first-order model, okay? So I, I have my point y where I'm trying to approximate my function, and I'm making my model around x. So I'll always use the notation f subscripted with x means the model is based around the point x. And what this is, fx of y, is just f of x, my function, plus the linear functional, which is the inner product of the gradient with y minus x, our distance from x. Okay, and so you can see here, you know, linear function. That's fairly familiar. Newton's method of course, makes a uh, second order model. So my model around the point x is just the two times Taylor approximation to my function. Uh, and we can imagine, you can imagine tons and tons of other models, okay? But so then what we do, sort of the generic-ish strategy for optimization is you pick some sequence of step sizes, which I'll represent by alpha k, and we iterate. xk plus one is the minimizer in whatever our constraints it is of f modeled around the point xk with some regularization so we don't go flying around all over the place. Okay, so that's, that's what a model is in optimization. And this is kind of a generic method. And a lot of methods fall in this framework. Uh, the classical proximal point methods fall in this. So that's the 70s Rockefeller gradient descent, Newton's method, or sort of regularized Newton methods. There's a method that we may get to, which is called the proximal linear method, which is similar to Gauss-Newton methods or levenberg marquardt if you're familiar with those. There's a lot of situations where you have things like this. All right. So, everybody clear on what I mean by an optimization model? Approximate my function around my current iterate, minimize this approximation. All right. Okay, so in the stochastic case, we're gonna take exactly the same approach, just instead of the true function, because we can't access that, it's a high dimensional integral, or maybe we don't know the true function because we just get samples. Well, what we're gonna do is draw a sample S, IID from our underlying distribution, and then we're going to update to get our next iterate by minimizing this model. So we're gonna minimize over our constraints and our model is gonna be centered around the point xk. It's just now a random function instead of the true function. Okay, and we're just gonna iterate this. And of course, uh, tons of examples fall into this. The stochastic gradient method uses linear approximations here. Uh, what are known as stochastic proximal point methods, sometimes called implicit gradient methods, fall in this. And in this case, for your sort of random realization of your function, you don't actually approximate the instantaneous function at all. You just use f of x comma s. Uh, and then this, you know, probably goes back to Rockefeller in some sense, but uh, 
Peter Bartlett and Brian Coolis had some work on this in 2010. Uh, oh gosh, I forget Karampat Siakis' first name. Uh, and John Langford, Bert Sikas, Tulis and Eroldi. Uh, a lot of folks have done some work on these proximal point ones. There are other, these kind of stochastic, uh, Levenberg Marquat or Gauss Newton or Prox linear methods are also some things that my students and I have worked on that fall in this kind of framework. <coughs> so that's what I mean by models. So we're going to talk today about approximate proximal point models, where we're thinking about what this approximation is and how it might make us more robust <coughs> or converge better or things like this. Okay, so we know this is a Cassie gradient method. Uh, just makes a linear approximation, but so let me give the three conditions that I'm going to start with when we do our analysis, okay? And we're going to use these three conditions throughout the talk, so I'm actually going to write them on the board. So condition one is that whatever model I'm using is convex. fx of dot comma s is convex. So we're going to leave these on the board. Condition two is that the function is a lower bound, so it's a lower approximation to my true function which is to say that fxys is always less than or equal to the true value for all y in whatever my constraint set is. And then three, I need a condition that I have some kind of local correctness, which is to say that at the point x, so whatever my current iterate is, wherever I'm building my model, my function actually has the right value, okay? And my subdifferential of my model, but only at the point x, oopsie, evaluated at y equals x, is contained in the true subdifferential of whatever random function I'm getting. Okay? So these are my three conditions. The picture is basically this. You know, we have our, well, I have our true function f, and so the types of models we might use are something like a linear approximation. So at x0, right, this is a linear approximation. Satisfies all of these, because linear functions are convex. It's correct there, and it's contained in the, has the right derivative. Uh, other things we might do are, okay, you know, if you know your function is non-negative, you could just truncate this approximation at zero, right? Uh, which, frankly, if you want to take one, home, one thing home from this talk, if you are solving any machine learning problem, you have a loss function, it's non-negative. You make a linear approximation to it. If your linear function says your loss is negative, it is not a good approximation anymore, because negative numbers are not positive. Right, so this is the, this is, I, I'm not kidding, this is the deep insight for this talk, is that less than zero is not greater than or equal to zero. So you could truncate this at zero if you knew that you had, say, a non-negative loss. Okay, uh, there are other things we might do. Oh, I keep forgetting where to point this thing. Uh, some alternatives, you know, you can, so, so we've got our subgradient approximations, we've got these kind of truncated approximations. You might say, okay, maybe you can take a bundle, what's known as a bundle or a multi-line type approximation, which would be, you know, you compute subgradients of your function at a bunch of points, and then just take the maximum of all of these. There's all sorts of different approximations that you might consider using, okay? All right, so that's what I mean when I say a model of a function. Any questions on these pictures? Yeah. I guess I, I sorry, I guess I missed this, but no. are you assuming that you have the gradient of the population loss or the no. empirical? Just the, not even the empirical loss, just a single observation, single sample. Okay. I'm not gonna, comp I'm not gonna do anything with a full sample. I'm gonna do one sample at a time. Everything's gonna be fully online. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a totally reasonable question. And please feel free to stop me at any point if something's confusing, yeah. But would you ever really use this multi-line? Because your representation kind of becomes really large, so if your step becomes more expensive if you're yeah, so the question is, would I ever use this kind of what we, we might call a bundle approximation or a multi-line approximation, which is a great question. Um, and so, so, so what we'll see in this talk is sometimes there's kind of a trade-off between the amount of computation you're willing to do when you, can com when you compute an instantaneous update and something like the stability properties or the long-term performance of these methods. And so this is a question, you know, so basically what you see sometimes is there's some kind of a trade-off between how much how careful you are willing to be in your updates versus you know, the performance of your methods. Oftentimes, frankly, you don't even need to make an approximation to your function at all because you're only computing an update for one sample and these are very easy functions to minimize. Uh, so you may not make any approximation to your single, you may, you may make no approximation to f of ys. You might just say, let's just use that in the update because it's only one sample, it's easy. All right, okay, so, so then, 
you know, with all of that said, all of these models are as possibilities, we're going to just consider this family of methods that draws a random sample and updates by minimizing my randomly sampled function or randomly sampled model. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what we might call sort of robustness or stability type properties for these methods. Uh, you know, why, why would we ever think about this kind of generality or things like this? So, um, let me do, let me give an example for why we might want to think about these things. So here's a, here's a linear regression problem with no noise. Okay, so it's a fairly straightforward linear regression problem. I'm going to observe literally bi equals ai transpose x star. Okay, and I'm going to iterate the stochastic gradient method on this average quadratic loss. All right, so when you actually write down these iterates, you know, for all iterations, xk plus 1 minus x star is i, that's the identity matrix, minus the outer product of your data, step size times your previous error. Okay, so you're just going to iterate this. And now, if the step sizes are a little bit too large, then at least at the beginning, you can actually diverge exponentially quickly, right? So you can kind of blow up in terms of your errors, right? This, if the, imagine the first step size times whatever this sigma is, this covariance here, is, uh, is large, then this is going to diverge exponentially, at least for the first some number of iterations until your step sizes get nailed down a little bit, right? And maybe you don't want this kind of transient exponential divergence. If it's too large, you can really get huge numerical instabilities for some of these problems. Um, okay, so, so let's, uh, let's put the lid on this and try to figure out, can we avoid this? And so, so here's a nice, here's a theorem that I find personally uh, satisfying, which is the following. So if you use this full stochastic proximal method, so remember this is, I draw a random sample and then I just minimize the single observation function plus a quadratic. So often this is a simple one-dimensional type optimization problem, they're not super hard to solve. Then, as long as the minimizers of your population exist, so it's non-empty, uh, and you have a finite variance of your gradients at the optimum, not everywhere, just at the optimum, that's all I care about, then my expected distance of my iterate to the optimum is bounded by my initial distance plus a sum of squared step sizes. Okay, you think, well, that doesn't tell me much, but it does tell you something. It tells you you'll never diverge exponentially, and as long as your step sizes are square summable, which is a typical condition, for example, if your step size is satisfied beta between half and one, then this says you will never diverge, well, you just won't diverge. So these methods cannot diverge ever, no matter what your problem is, as long as at the optimum you have finite variance. Right, and then uh, it turns out actually under the same assumptions, you're actually guaranteed convergence. These can, I mean, I'm not gonna give you a rate in this sort of absurd generality, but you will converge. The distance to the optimal set remains bounded, and this distance will converge to zero as your iterates go to infinity. All right, just to give you kind of a, an example where this wouldn't happen. So think about your function. Suppose you had the function f of x <coughs> equals e to the x plus e to the minus x. Okay, you run gradient descent on this. If you start away from zero and use essentially any step size, you're going to find yourself start oscillating very quickly and you will actually diverge. Whereas this, of course, you know, at x equals zero, the derivative is two. No, zero, sorry. <laughs> the average. <laughs> Whatever. The derivative is a constant, or less. And uh, so it won't diverge when you run these methods, OK? So already we're seeing a little bit of benefit. All right. So you get this kind of robustness for free. Now you might ask, OK, well, this full stochastic proximal method, that might be kind of expensive. There are weakenings of this where you only have to solve this to reasonable accuracies, and then everything still goes through exactly the same way. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, though. But this does show you that, you know, if you can spend a little bit more computation to actually solve this update, then you can get a lot of benefits, at least in theory. Okay. Um, here's another theorem which basically just says uh, if you actually have some kind of strong convexity or expected strong convexity of your objectives, meaning that your random functions are lower bounded by a quadratic, this may be low rank, but some kind of quadratic, uh, then these things actually converge. So you will converge in expectation. Uh, and the rate at which you will converge is basically k, that's your iterates, times your step size squared. So you will actually converge no matter what. And we can give an explicit rate for this. Is this also robust to your regularizer, your second term? Uh, uh, if you go back to the second term. This guy? Yeah. Yeah, so, so what you're seeing, I mean, this, this alpha k is what's determining this. So what if you or, change L2 to something else? 
Oh, you want to do something like mirror descent or something like that? Yeah. Um, I haven't done the analysis, but uh, let, let me. The, the steps that we go through are exactly the steps you go through to prove convergence of mirror descent and things like this. So, uh, so I can, I mean, I, I can work through the proof and nothing will change if we were to do that. I mean, it would, some things about how you measure distances and stuff would change, but at least at this asymptotic level, nothing would, nothing would be different. But I assume it would go faster with the curves, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, this, there's no rate, right? It's just yeah. that it goes to zero, yeah. and so there's no rates or anything like that. Uh, here, you might be able to see some differences because you'd be measuring the variances in a different way. And so that, that's certainly plausible, but, and, and what, that is what would happen, but we didn't, uh, we didn't go through that. But yeah, you could push through this through in kind of mirror descent settings. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe a very uh, pure mathematics question. So suppose beta equals one over uh, uh, one half. Beta so equals one half. Uh, so do you have some example that, that it diverges for sure or infinity open or something like that? I don't. I don't. I don't know what happens outside of my beta equals one half to one. I mean, when beta is bigger than one, it definitely won't converge because it just doesn't make enough progress. It just terminates early. Uh, when beta is less than a half, I'm less clear. I don't know exactly what would happen. I mean, the average iterates would have some kind of convergence, but whether the actual iterate itself would converge, I'm not sure. I don't know. Is it correct to interpret, I mean, draw the conclusion that it kind of advocates uh, bigger batches because the variance will be smaller? Uh, yeah, so the question is, do, am I advocate, is one possible conclusion of this, bigger batches would be better because variance would be smaller? Um, my res the, the, the results in this paper don't really speak to that. And actually, uh, a, a big open question here is like how you would treat bigger batches in this kind of iteration, because it would get more computationally expensive to perform the updates. It's a way of, of uh, trading uh, computation. Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's total. it's a great question, and I honestly don't know the answer. I mean, that's a, that, to me, that's an open question. Like, if I have parallel computation or things like this where I can do big batches, can I extend some of these results and these ideas? And I don't know. Uh, it's de I'm, I'm not sure yet. So, so maybe, uh, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't nailed it down enough to be able to answer that convincingly. I do list it as an open question at the end, though. Okay, all right, so, um, so that's that. Uh, so just, just kind of a fun example. So this is what happens on this least squares objective where you run stochastic gradient method. This is uh, five different runs. And you can see that over the first 100 or so steps, stochastic gradient method does diverge exponentially in terms of its loss. And then it kind of gets it nailed back down eventually, right? And then the proximal point and these related methods, you know, they just kind of get down to the optimum reasonably quickly. I mean, they're both getting there eventually. It's just one of them gets there a lot more quickly than the others. Okay, uh, yeah, so we can, as I said, um, we don't really need this full proximal point method. You can do accurate enough approximations, things are going to be okay. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you what those are offline. There, we don't really need convexity for some of these results, uh, and we may talk about those as well. There are some kind of weaker notions of, well, what's called weak convexity or semi-convexity. There are 15 names for this. Is Jason here? No, he knows some other ones, but I don't remember them all. Uh, anyway, so, so there, we, can, we can kind of go beyond what I've said before. Okay, so let me, let me now give, uh, give some, some results that actually have rates of convergence associated to them, okay? So let's start with this classic theorem on uh, averaging and stochastic gradient methods by Polyak and Uditsky. So the theorem is if F, our population is convex and it's strongly convex near X star, the optimum point, uh, and our functions are smooth, our random functions are smooth, meaning their derivatives are Lipschitz. Then, if we run the stochastic gradient method asymptotically, the average of the iterates, or the average distance, sort of normalized by root k, converges in distribution to a normal with a mean zero, and inverse Hessian, inverse Hessian, and covariance. This is kind of intuitive. The more curvature you have, the easier the problem should be. The more variance there is at optimum, the harder the problem should be. Okay, this assumes some kind of global smoothness and things like this, though. Turns out, if you run any of our approximate methods, as long as you can guarantee that the iterates remain bounded, period. If they remain bounded, so they don't diverge to infinity, then you're going to get this asymptotic normality. So you don't, you don't require that the fx's are smooth globally. You only require that in some neighborhood of x star, the true optimum, they are smooth. So for example, this result does not apply to the function e to the x. Or if you're a statistician, it doesn't apply in Poisson regression or most GLMs. Whereas here, 
if you have a nice, a, a good enough approximation that you remain bounded, where the heck are? If you remain bounded, then as soon as you have satisfied these three conditions, convex model, it's a lower bound, and it's locally correct, it doesn't even matter if your models are differentiable, I don't actually care about that, then you will get this optimal asymptotic normality. Okay? And that is the optimal asymptotic co covariance. So that's uh, the uh, local asymptotic minimax theorem says that this is optimal. And, and basically the key insight here is that because we know when we use these models that we will converge with probability one, eventually, uh, even if our approximations are, say, this truncated thing and are not differentiable, there are some kind of variational principles that say eventually we're almost doing a stochastic gradient procedure really close to the optimum. Even if we're not quite doing it, there's some, there's some nice uh, analytic tools you can do to get this. So you get this kind of nice asymptotic normality result no matter what your objectives are as long as you have smoothness near X star. You can blow up exponentially, super exponentially outside of things. It doesn't matter. Right. Okay. All right, so uh, now what I think... There's a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Levi. I didn't see you. You're behind a pillar. Why can't you assume xk to be bounded? Because xk is produced by your algorithm. Yeah, why can I assume that? That's a good question. Yeah, so why I can assume that is because I have this theorem, which is that if I use the stochastic proximal point method or a good enough approximation to it, and I can quantify what that means very precisely if you want me to, but I'll do it offline maybe, then with probability 1, the supremum of the distance between xk and the optimal set is bounded. I don't, I don't care what the bound is, just that it remains, it never diverges. So with prob all, all I care is that it's less than infinity, and then at least in some asymptotic sense, come on, I will get this rate of convergence, which is 1 on root k, with the optimal covariance structure at the end of the day. Okay? Yeah, so that's why I can assume the iterates remain bounded. How does the bound affect the delay? Oh, you know, there's some lower order terms. That's why I'm doing asymptotics. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I honestly have no idea. But let's, uh, but yeah, so that's a good question. There, in like the standard cases of Lipschitz functions and things like this, we can recover all of the standard results. But uh, here I'm not totally sure what the higher order terms would be. Okay, so, so let me now talk about what I think are kind of a fun set of problems that have recently started cropping up, uh, which are what I'll call easy problems, okay? Uh, and by easy problem, I mean something that has a sort of consistent solution for all of our samples. So, so what is an easy problem? An easy problem is something like an interpolation problem. So this, if, you, if you've been following uh, Misha Belkin, uh, Sasha Rocklin, Sasha Tsibakov, Daniel Tsu, I forget Mitra's uh, first name, and others, you know, they've talked about stochastic optimization problems or statistical learning problems where the solution, a good solution literally interpolates the data perfectly has zero loss, has zero training error, okay, and still has good statistical performance. Uh, another kind of easy problem, meaning you have a perfect solution for all your samples, linear systems that are over-parameterized, or if you want to find a point that's in a uh, intersection of convex sets. So let's talk about easy problems. So an easy problem, when I say easy problem, I mean I want to minimize a function f of x, but the problem is easy. If there's an x star such that for all of your samples s, f at x star is actually equal to the infimal value of f of x, okay? So like you actually perfectly fit all of your samples. And you're like, you know, if you're a statistician, you know, if you're one of my students at Stanford, you're frowning, Stephen is frowning a lot, he's unhappy with this. But there are reasons to think that this might actually happen. There's a lot of problems, say like deep learning, where you perfectly interpolate the training data and it seems to do okay, right? And there are, there are a number of others, but um, we're gonna impose one additional condition here. Okay, so in addition to my condition it's one through three, or one, two, three, I'm going to have condition four, which is that my model is always above uh, the minimal value of the instantaneous loss. F, X, Y, S is always greater than or equal to infimum over all, oh, let's write Z, Z, F of Z, S. Okay. So this would be, you know, if you have a squared error, say, you know, linear regression, then zero is this value. For most machine learning problems, zero is this value. Okay, you just know that your loss is minimized when it takes the value zero. Okay, and so I'm just going to truncate all my models at this minimal value. So in addition to one through three, I'm going to have this fourth condition that you have the lower bound. And that's it. And then once you've got this, 
you can prove a number of interesting things. So let's suppose that F satisfies this growth condition, which is basically strong convexity, okay? or a slightly weaker version of it, which is that F of X grows at least quadratically away from the optimal set. Then you can prove that in expectation, the distance of your iterate from the optimal set squared is less than the maximum of e to the minus sum of your step sizes and e to the minus k times the initial distance. Okay, and c is a constant that depends on lambda uh, in a slightly weird way, so I don't want to get into it. Okay, so no matter what your step size sequence is, as soon as you have this lower bound condition, that's four, you're basically adapting and getting this exponential or linear convergence. All right. Uh, and it happens no matter the step sizes. And there have been results like this in these kind of interpolation type problems. But typically they require sort of very precise exact step size choices that reflect knowledge of the problem that you typically wouldn't have. Uh, you know, and also the step size choices won't work in other problems, say like where you aren't perfectly separable data. All right. Okay, uh, so, so another, another class of problems where we actually have some you can show fast convergence of these methods as soon as you have one, two, three, and four as your conditions. It's what are known as problems with sharp growth. So this is to say f of x grows at least linearly away from x star. Okay, so when might you have something like this? Uh, this would be, say, if you have a piecewise linear objective, or maybe you have some kind of hinge loss, or you have a classification problem, say, where your data is perfectly separable. Okay, so then you, if you actually look at these problems and write down how they grow away from the optimum, you'll see that they actually have kind of level curves, which are basically growing linearly away from the optimal set. All right. Another example would be, say, you want to find a, pro a point in the intersection, say, of three convex sets, C1, C2, and C3. Okay, so here's our intersection of these sets. Well, then a nice objective that's going to be minimized only on that intersection is the sum of your distances to each of these sets. Okay? And that also, you can prove, is going to satisfy this kind of sharp growth condition. All right, so as soon as you have a problem like this, say finding a point on the intersection of convex sets, or a separable classification problem, uh, then when you iterate these methods, as long as you satisfy one through four, you will get, again, fast linear convergence. All right? so this is not you know, one on square root k or one on k, this is exponentially fast, e to the minus k or e to the minus sum of your step sizes. All right. Yeah? Nothing. So uh, yep. Yes, you can take alpha to be literally infinity. But these problems are very special, right? They say that there is a consistent solution that works for all of your data, right? Um, but the key is that you have this condition that says your model is always an upper bound on the infimal value that your function takes. So you actually stop your models, you truncate them at, say, zero. So you just threshold them out. You want, yeah. Depends on that. It's like linear or uh, yeah, it's, it's linear, but there's some kind of dependence on the variability in your sampling, which I am sweeping completely under the rug. Um, it's in the paper, which you can certainly look at. Basically, for well-conditioned problems, C looks nice. For poorly conditioned problems, C looks less nice. There's some kind, there's some kind of conditioning going on in there that I didn't really want to get into. But yeah, uh, it's, it's important to actually nail down what that is, and we do it in examples in the paper. So how is the infimum coming? If I'm off my, my infimum, so if I'm like uh, overestimated. If you overestimate it? Yeah. Well, um, then if you, it will uh, enter there. Right? Well, if you overestimate the infimum, then you're no longer going to have this lower bound condition, which is that your model is always also lower than your function. Right. So you can't satisfy this while being too large on your guess of this guy. You just can't. And so I don't actually know what will happen. But luckily, for most problems, you're doing like the squared error, exponential loss, logistic loss, hinge loss. Your infimum is always zero. You're just like, it's a loss. It's lower bounded by zero. Let's call it a day. But I'm working on a loss that I don't know the saturation. But I'll talk to you. Yeah, you no, know, we can talk about that later. I mean, there are, there are other cases where you can compute saturations actually exactly. I mean, and I should just say, like, you know, even if your problem is not in this sort of ridiculous, easy setting where everything has the same solution, you know, you can still write down these four things and you will still get convergence in all of the standard cases. You know, you will be adaptive. If you don't happen to get an easy problem, it'll still work. It's just it will work a lot better if you get an easy problem in a nice way. 
So I think easy problems, one, one reason they, they, you, you solve them and then you keep going because you want the, it, you're not actually optimizing, you know, you're optimizing something as a proxy for your test error. Right. So do your methods also give you a good test error? Um, in the, in the sense that the, these methods will give you the same solution that if you ran the stochastic gradient method to infinity, they, if that works, then these will work. You know, they'll just get there a lot faster. Um, among the optimal solutions. Among, among the, the optimal solutions. solutions you get the same. Among the optimal solution, basically you would get the solution that's in the span of your data, which is the minimum norm solution or the minimum norm interpolant. So that's the one you'll get, which I'm not always clear if that's exactly the one you want, but that's the one we've well, not we, uh, like Belkin, Ma, Basili, and all of those collaborators have been analyzing is these sort of minimum norm interpolants. And that's what we will get to, yes. Shine? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is equivalent to a maximum margin solution, right? This would get you to the maximum margin solution, yes. Yeah, if you were doing like the hinge loss for a classification problem, it would be max margin. Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, let's revisit some of these experimental results just so we can kind of understand them more in the context of the results I've been talking about. Um, so remember, we're iterating minimize our random model, uh, and we're going to compare three methods. One is stochastic gradient. One is this truncated method where literally I'm like, okay, my function is non-negative, so I'm just going to take the positive part of my linear approximation. And the last one is I'm actually going to run the full stochastic proximal point method. So I'm actually going to just solve the full update exactly. All right, so we're going to compare these three. So here's... Uh, Here's a, here's a first experiment. So this is linear regression problem where the noise in our observations for BI is fairly small. Okay? I'm sorry, I should know what it is, but I don't remember. Um, and what you see is that you know, there's some regime where the stochastic gradient method is convergent, say between step sizes 0.1 and 1. Uh, the full proximal method is convergent for a wider range of step sizes. And it turns out in this experiment, actually, these truncated methods where you just say stop going once you hit 0, have great convergence for this five orders of magnitude worth of step sizes. Okay. Uh, then if you have no noise, these things all, well, the truncated and proximal methods work superbly. They very quickly find the solution. Again, stochastic gradient method, even though this problem is trivial, there is no noise. The stochastic gradient method works for the step size of 1, 2, and like 0.5, and very quickly does not function as well. Right. Uh, here's a linear regression problem with what I'll call poor conditioning. Okay, this actually, this one I did include this bundle method where we did two linear approximations to our function. Uh, so this is uh, linear regression with poor conditioning on our data matrix, okay? So you can see I changed the colors, I apologize. Stochastic gradient in method in red never gets to accuracy better than 0.05. All right, so who, who has an idea of what the poor conditioning means in this problem? Bad condition number. Yeah, what's a bad condition number on the data matrix? 10. Okay, it's very close. This is condition number 15. Uh, right? So, so, I mean, I, don't, I ran this experiment. I was like, uh, uh, this can't be right. Like, a condition number 15 is not poorly conditioned, but it turns out it's right. Uh, you know, I mean, if you ran long enough, eventually this will converge, but it's just not converging as soon as the data is a little bit off of isotropic Gaussian random vectors, right, which you should, I don't know, to me this gives me pause about re relying on stochastic gradient methods. Okay, uh, absolute regression loss with no noise, you know, similar story, narrow range of step sizes where the stochastic gradient method works, others work for substantially more, you just get a little bit better approximation. Uh, Multi-class hinge loss, okay. Well, what, what happens, sorry, if there, experimentally, if there is a lot of noise? Ah, if there is a lot of noise, so this is what's happening, here's a uh, Okay, so here's what's happening. I put in a bunch of noise in this absolute regression experiment, okay? And this massive shaded area is actually a 95% confidence interval on what's happening. Uh, and the truncated method and the proximal point method are actually right on top of each other, so that they have exactly the same behavior in this particular problem. So what you see is with this mat a lot of noise case, stochastic gradient method has a narrow window where it converges. These proximal and truncated methods have a broader range of convergence. It's not, you know, this full massive thing that you saw before, but it is a little bit more robust to your step size choice. Say, you know, instead of just 0.1, you're getting maybe one additional order of magnitude here. And then sometimes it still works out here. So it's not, it's not like a panacea, but it's when it's easy, it nails it. And when it's not easy, it's at least a little better and sometimes 
more. And it's basically free to implement, implement this method at least. Okay, uh, multi-class hinge loss with no noise. Here's multi-class hinge loss with a little bit of label flipping, say like, oh, what was this, 1% flipping of labels. And here you can again still see that these truncated and approximal point methods are getting much better behavior in terms of convergence. Uh, and then more noise again, you see that the behaviors start to get closer together, but there's still a gap. Here's some non-convex problems. So this is minimizing absolute value of x squared minus b, because we can. Uh, and again, you see something actually fairly similar. Basically, you, can, you run a, an analog of what I'll call these, uh, the truncated methods, which we call a proxilinear method. Stochastic gradient or full proximal methods. And again, stochastic gradient method, narrow window of step sizes where it's functional, everything else much broader. You guys are probably getting bored with these. Matrix completion, same thing happens. I did an experiment with CIFAR because neural networks, hooray. Uh, again, um, you know, the stochastic gradient method and stochastic gradient methods with momentum have sort of a narrow regime of step sizes where they work. When you truncate the loss at zero, there's a broader range of step sizes where things still converge. I should say this with full caveats, we need to do a lot more experiments with neural nets, but they just take a while and we haven't finished them all. So, I, I'm sorry. Uh, that's it. Okay, so uh, then I was going to talk about this if time, but I think I will skip all of this. Do, 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 and... Okay, conclusions. So, uh, you know, I think the first conclusion is that, you know, maybe for... And, and I, I know you guys believe this, but it's not clear to me that we always sort of live by this, but like blind application of stochastic gradient methods is not always the right answer. And if you're a little bit careful and just do a little better modeling of the problem you have at hand, you can get a lot better performance. You know, and sometimes strikingly better performance. You can adapt to problem difficulty, you can be more robust to large variances in your functions, all sorts of things. Uh, you know, there's often considerations of computational efficiency when you choose the models that you want to minimize. And so there might be some trade-offs between computation versus convergence. We haven't totally nailed those down, but it's clear if you're willing to pay a little bit more for computation, you can do better. Um, there's a bunch of open questions left here. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's a lot of fun to work on these. You know, there are questions of sort of how do we actually adapt to functions? You know, what about the second order terms and a lot of our bounds? Because certainly some of mine were asymptotic. Um, how do you deal with parallelism? So all of this was kind of single observation at a time, you know, fully sequential methods. I didn't talk about parallelism or mini batches or any of that at all. I don't know how to do it. Uh, and I think it's a, I, I'd love to understand better how you can actually solve those types of problems. So thanks a lot for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take more questions. More questions? What's the worst uh, ratio you've come across between how much it costs to, to minimize the, you know, the SGM model function and how much it costs to minimize your model function? Yeah, I mean, I've come, I mean, of course we could make them really bad, right? But uh, In a natural problem. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think that uh, there's a set of experiments that I haven't done. Or, sorry, I didn't include. We've done them. Uh, which is known as, say, like Poisson regression. So in Poisson regression, your objective is something like f of x a b is equal to um, x of a x uh, basically minus b a x okay so you want to minimize this plus a quadratic function of x all right and that's actually not that hard it's a one-dimensional problem but there's no closed form or anything you have to develop some kind of iterative methods for it and the question of whether this you know so so you want to minimize this well sorry this plus you know one half x 2 norm squared. So this isn't hard particularly, but it does take, you know, whatever you want to solve it to epsilon accuracy is going to take log 1 on epsilon sort of steps at every iteration instead of just one step. And so, you know, there's going to be some trade-off in terms of stability and convergence. And I wish I had the plots. Uh, I didn't do any real serious timing comparisons. We were just looking at iteration complexities. You know, but there are certainly going to be worse examples. Uh, question. I think the experiment in CIFA looks pretty impressive. I was just wondering, like, when you change your model to like those truncated, uh, like below, and I was wondering when you apply that to non convex setting. Can you say something about finding stationary point or? Yeah, you can. You um, can also say that it's mm -hmm. faster in finding this. So that's an interesting question. Um, here, here's a type of result I can show. Okay. 
So let's suppose you have a, a, a weakly convex objective, which means that if you add a big enough quadratic, it becomes convex. If this thing has sharp growth, and this is a weird conditional result, and for some reason you converge to a global optimum, which often you do, then that convergence is going to be really fast. It's going to be asymptotically linear or exponential, depending on how you think about these things. Okay, so we have results like that, which are not 100% satisfying, but we can prove that you converge to stationary points. We can prove that if you converge to the right one, it'll happen super fast. But those, I think, are about as much as you could possibly hope for. So you still need some kind of weak convex. Like yeah, we need some kind of weak convexity or something like this. But there, there are still reasons to do better approximations. We can prove convergence in more general scenarios with better approximations. Completely, you know, sort of a parallel story for the weakly convex cases for the convex case. But the convex case, everything is kind of, it's clear what's happening more so than in this weird, like, if you converge, then you do it fast kind of thing. Thanks. Okay. Uh, should we do one? Well, let's do one more and then we'll. Sorry, for the, the CFA plus, was that like S accuracy or was that train accuracy? Or, or That's a great question. Uh, I think it's train accuracy. No, 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 no. Sorry, it was eighty-six percent. It was test accuracy. Okay. It was it was test accuracy. Yeah. Um, but but again, you know, this, we don't have confidence intervals for that experiment. It was like we did two, and they both looked good. Uh, <laughs> and then I put it in the slides, and I was like, we better run some more. And then Hilal was like, yeah, the more senior students keep using all the computers, and they won't let me get any computer time. And then I'm here. Uh, <laughs> this is like, it's like having children, you know, like my one-year-old punches my three-year-old, my senior students take all the computers, right? Uh, uh, you know. These guys are all innocent. They're none of my students. So these Stanford students are good ones. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll go to the reception. Yeah, let's go drink. Uh,